now for your listening pleasure, here's Polizzi and Rose, covering the week of media, marketing, and digital content news. This old marketing. Take it away, boys. Hello, my friends. This is Robert Rose, and welcome to episode number 282 of This Old Marketing, recorded on Thursday, July 29th, 2021. And with me, as always, my good friend, my colleague, and a guy who's ready to tell you all about why he hates the new Cleveland Guardians name and logo, (laughs) Mr. Joe Polizzi. (laughs) I didn't know you were going to bring that up. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I should have known. But Yeah, well, of course. Well, first of all, I have to say that I have uh, a really good friend that works at the Cleveland Indians, and I feel my heart goes out to him right now because he's just dealing with a lot of stuff. They're, oh, I can imagine he's just getting all kinds of hate letters and tweets and. Uh, well, you're getting it's 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 two things. You get both sides of it, well, of course. You get both sides. It's of two it, right? things. It's one, the Cleveland Indians. For, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, the Cleveland Indians announced about 18 months ago that they were changing the name from Cleveland Indians to something else, and they announced right. last week that yes, indeed, they were changing it. It's going to be the Cleveland Guardians. And then they released the logo at the same time. So not only are people, again, upset that, oh, hey, we're losing our name and our identity, but then they can pick on a new logo, which that's right is never going to be a win. Am I a huge you fan of it? You can't win that game. Yeah, I'm you not a huge fan of it. That I see it as a transitional logo. I know why they did what they did. It's sort of a... It, they took Guardians and, you know, the Indians, so the IANS is sort of similar... I see what they're doing, but nobody's happy and right. whatever. I, but nobody <laughs> listened to me. Whatever. Did I tell you about this? Nobody listened to me. I came out a long time ago. This is right when they first said they were going to do a name change. And I have been telling anyone that will listen that the Cleveland Indians should be the first uh, United States major sports program that sells the naming rights. I really wanted them to do that. Now... You can't be like the Cleveland State Farms, but you could be the Cleveland Progressives. You could be the Cleveland Pros. You sell that, let's say, for a billion dollars over the next five to seven years, the naming rights, and you take that money and you reinvest it into the team, which that's the problem. Cleveland, The Cleveland baseball team is a small market team. We don't have the money that a New York Yankees or a Boston Red Sox does, so they we can't spend all the money like they can. So we get it all the time. The ownership says, we can't compete. So we can't, we have to sell our good players and, you know, we'll, maybe we'll make it to the playoffs this year, but we're not going to get a solid bat or a number one person in our rotation, whatever the case is. Well, if you sell the naming rights, that goes away. You have that money. So, but nobody, alas, Robert, Uh, alas, (laughs) nobody listens to me. Well, that's probably good. (laughs) Um. (laughs) What have you been hearing? I mean... Did you just see the headlines and see people? Well, no, I've been it? following it. I've been following it somewhat. And if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. The reason that it's called the Guardians is the br- there are two statues on a bridge or something right. like that. Yes, that the Bob Hope Bridge. That everybody knows, yep. right? That everybody knows as the the Guardians. And so, the Guardians as a name for those in the know, right? Basically, those you know, forgive the pun, inside baseball was not a terrible surprise, right? It was like, oh, of course, that it makes It was the number one. Sense. Yeah, some people said the spiders. Right. We used to be called the spiders years ago. There were some other things that were going around. That I have no problem with the name Guardians. Yeah, Guardians is great. I mean, especially now with the, you know, sort of, you know, you got Guardians of the Galaxy. You got, you know, Guardians as a, as a you know, as a name is a, is a great Yeah, because I, I actually think they're going to hire Chris Pratt as their new mascot. So I think it's going to work out great. <laughs> right there you go the ladies there are gonna go. love it. people are gonna love it they're just gonna be great yeah but yes yeah, yeah. So. the logo it, to me uh you know is i wouldn't have gone that direction i guess is my point um you know it but i, I don't care like it's not my team i don't you know so i'm following it with interest only because of you, quite frankly, and all of the people I know and love in the Cleveland area. Um, so, 
it, it's a little, I wouldn't have gone the cartoon route. Yep. Um, I would have gone a little more, you know, iconic and sort of, you know, statuesque. I think for, they for, will. For, for, you know. And I think this is what I, somebody was just complaining. I said, what are we going to do? Like I, this, this is like, it's not etched in stone. This is, if you look at the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Cleveland's basketball team, they've had like three logos in the last 10 years. Logos change right. all the time, except if you're an iconic franchise like the Cubs or the Yankees or the Red Sox. They don't mess with it. They don't have to. That's right. But if you look at all the new basketball teams, if you look at the New Orleans Pelicans, if you look at the you know, uh, uh, the Miami Marlins, and they change their logo all the time. Because sure. they can't. Because NFL, you know NFL teams do it, too. NFL teams do it, too. You could yeah. sell more stuff. That's why the Browns right. change their exactly. they change their orange color, their PMS orange, just a little bit every year. <laughs> oh, you got to buy the new <laughs> orange. You're in the old orange. Yeah, that's crazy. That's right. Yeah, Cowboys, you don't change anything. Well, they don't change. Well, they have though. They they have. I mean, they have changed logos. They changed logos once. Um, and when they very first started the team, the the original logo, which I have a hat of, of course, is uh, a football player riding on a horse, which is just stupid, but it's awesome in because of its nostalgia. Um, but uh, no, the star has been around since really the the beginning of of everything. But the blue, um, the silver, that has changed quite a bit over the last. 40, 50 years, right? You know, in terms of how they wear it, where they wear it, you know, if you go back and you look at their, you know, the, the old, uh, which they used to wear all the time on Thanksgiving and will this year, because the NFL finally approved that the, the helmet, it used to be a blue star. And, and that was the whole thing. It was like this blue star on a white helmet, um, which was, you know, it's still my favorite it, every Thanksgiving when they wear that, it's like, I love that logo and the way that it's on the helmet because mm-hmm. it looks so old school. Um, but, um, but now of course it's the silver star and on a, you know, on a, on a, with a blue outline and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, they change all the time. So I'm, I'm, I'm with the you. last, the last um, thing I'll say on it, which we went to the, yeah. the Cleveland baseball team game yesterday, whatever you call them now, Indians guardians. And I was looking at the field. Literally, there was only one spot available for any form of sponsorship or advertising. Every, even the mound is sponsored. The field is sponsored. <laughs> yeah. Everything is sponsored. And people are, are ranting and raving and saying, we can't sell the name because it's sacred. What? You, right. You're selling everything. Why is that? <laughs> right. That's where you're going to draw the line? I'm, I'm like, come on. So anyways, that, that was yeah. my, my thing. Now, before we get started, because I know I want to talk about a couple other things here. Yeah. We right. were on Twitter. We were tweeting back and forth, and people were talking about, you know, you and I arguing about NFTs like we do almost every episode. And I threw it on you, and I said, well, Robert has to stop complaining until he buys an NFT. And you came right. back, and you said, I have. And I want right. it. So here's your opportunity uh, my opportunity. I would like to, yeah, I would like. <laughs> I like how it's positioned as my opportunity <laughs> to redeem myself. But okay, well, I, you keep know, going. I, I'm just yeah. curious, like, why, why? What did you buy? Can you can you even share that? Of okay. course, I'm happy yeah, to we'll share it. Yes, I mean, so I went. I, I've had an account on OpenSea since you know, transparency all the way around. You told me to go. Well, open by the way, one. Open OpenSea um, is sort of the the eBay of NFT marketplaces, so people know. That's okay. right, and the biggest one i think right i it's believe the, it is it's the, the biggest of the marketplaces yes. um so i i had i had an account there um and uh, this is a i don't know a couple of weeks ago or whatever i started looking around i was like yeah i do want to go through the process of seeing what this is all about so i did buy uh, a collectible um i thought it was the perfect representation of um my feelings toward the whole thing. What I bought was there's a series that has come out called the Monas, which are Mona Lisa's done in a very pixelated way. So it's an, uh, it's a, I guess a series of artists or a group of artists that have done these. I think there's a series of a thousand of them, um, or maybe it's 5,000 now because they're doing that thing that you talked about where the first thousand are X price, yep. then from 2000 to 3000 is Y price and so on and so forth. So I wanted to buy an early quote unquote edition of one of these because the one I found was perfect. It's a Mona Lisa that is vomiting up rainbows that is holding a baby Dogecoin icon 
uh, with uh, a a, a um, uh, with a, a Lamborghini wearing she's wearing a Lamborghini logo dress. I thought that was the perfect representation like of how real I feel. Art to me, this sounds it's, it's wonderful. It, it, in a weird thing, it, I, I actually kind of like, like it. it. I think you it's kind of like cool. It. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It yeah, is it's all cool. yours. And it's all mine. Oh. It's all mine. So so we'll see. We'll see what happens to did it. You know, and it if, with um, an auction or was it a flat price or how did you how did you do that? There was both. Okay. Um, this was an one that was already owned and was being sold. Um, so basically, uh, there are many that are under auction at the moment. But I bought one of the I wanted to buy one of the earlier editions. Um, and all full transparency, I paid 150 bucks for it. Um, just be, be, and super the whole point. An NFT. Yeah, it's, of course. Yeah, very, very cheap for an NFT. So we'll see. We'll That's see. Awesome. We'll see what I am happens. So proud of yeah. you. I I will say this. I, I'm going to say this. The OpenSea website blows. It is awful to try and browse and look at things because the other thing I wanted to do. We, we were going to actually talk about it on the show, and then I decided that it didn't make the cut because of all the other things we wanted to talk about. Was Yet another brand, Campbell's Soup in this case, um, has uh, launched an NFT of a one of a kind uh, Campbell's Soup iconic, you know, art original art piece that they're doing. Um, and I was like, oh, I, you know, I saw it on Ad Age, and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go check it out. So I go to their press release, which has a link um, that doesn't work that goes to the OpenSea platform. So I go into OpenSea and get, you know, log in and all that, search for Campbell's Soup. Nothing comes up for them. And so I have to go back to the press release, click into it again. It works this time and it comes back, you know, with the actual thing and there's an auction and blah, blah, blah. And it was, you know, at the, t- at the time of this airing is right around 500 bucks. And I was like, yeah, it's a little rich for me right now. But, um, but I, I just, the whole process for me to, Search, find, purchase, and look at my account to see that my purchase went yep. through was absolutely horrific. And if they don't fix that, I, you know, you're, everything else I've set aside, it's going to fail the, like you're hard. You're at the pong level right now. Of course, it's going Agreed. to improve. The wallet yeah. integration is going to. I mean, so if you want to do this, everybody, whoever, whoever hasn't done this, you have to first get a wallet. You probably get one with MetaMask. So that, that it integrates with OpenSea. And then you have to fund your wallet. So you probably have to go on Coinbase and fund your wallet with Ethereum. So you have to do that. And then you have to go on to this crappy website called OpenSea and figure out the bidding process. So it that's temporary. Yeah, it blows. Yeah, it's going it blows. to be fine. It's going to be seamless at some point. By the way, venture. I went wanted to look this up, which is why I was typing. OpenSea raised $100 million out of $1.5 billion valuation last week. So... They will probably have enough yeah. money to fix their hopefully interface. to fix things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fix things, right? Yeah, I will. I will say this: I wasn't a fan initially of. So I use my Coinbase wallet. Oh, by okay, the way. got it. Uh, so I wasn't a fan the first time I had to hold up my phone and scan the little Q card thing to log in. Like you don't have a username and password on OpenSea. You, it's attached to That's your wallet. Exactly right. You have a, a wallet and, address. Correct. And so the way you log in is you actually open up your phone. I mean, you can do this with a browser plugin as well, but I'm doing it um, with my phone. You hold up your phone to the screen and the wallet sends a message to the website to say, yeah, this is who this is. Let them in. I thought that was cool. I I thought that was really neat Uh, that, you know, you don't actually have a login and password. It, It basically stored in your Coinbase wallet, which is Good for them and good for the user, I think, ultimately. Uh, I There's nothing wrong with the Coinbase wallet. I like MetaMask, uh, and if I had a choice, that's what I would go with. Uh, and on MetaMask, I don't know. It was just easy for me. Yeah. It was just easy for I, me because I, like I have a Coinbase you account. Create, and, you can create yeah. multiple uh, accounts within your address. So you can create five or six or seven different you came with the coin, inside. You, you came with the can Coinbase. Really, I've you never used Coinbase. Coinbase. Yeah, you, yeah you, came, you came with the Coinbase, too. It's, it's called wa- Link Wallet. Oh. Link, you know, there's a whole little app within the app called the Wallet Link where you can link it to different things. Very nice. Well, regardless, yeah. I would love to see your art hanging in your digital display room. 
at some point. I'm actually going to try and print one and put and hang it up in my office. Yeah, I'm going to try. I'm going to try and print it out nice and 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 hang it that, up because I think that's it is that's, that's fun. Yeah, it's, that's it's kind cool. of fun. And you can tell everybody yeah. you own the smart contract to this, and it could be worth a hundred and sixty-five dollars. That's in correct. A, in a year. Yes, in, in in ten years. Yes, <laughs> or it may be worth nothing. Nada. But it's fu- it's fun nonetheless. So, yeah. so I, I'm still not any more of a fan. Just FYI, I'm still the same cranky dude. But I I have been through the process, and I did find it. I did find that piece of art quite enjoyable because it exemplifies my feelings. I, I think that's great, and I and this is what I would recommend. And what I I think you did, you did it the perfect way because you went and you tested it out. And you check, you didn't spend an arm and a leg. People think you got to go on and, and buy a crypto punk or something for thirty thousand dollars. You don't have to go buy something. No, go inexpensive. No, no, no. There's yeah. a lot of really interesting projects going on available on OpenSea. Check them out. Go well. Here's go the, and figure it here's, out and and experiment. He, experiment. Here's the business idea. The business idea is to go create the Sotheby's Guide or the you know the you know, some sort of easy to use, not a discord group, not some weird sort of down a dark alleyway thing. I mean, a real guide and frequently updated guide about the, you know, what's trending, what's I, you can't find any of that right now. Like I went online to go do search, like who are the artists that I should be following? Who are the, you know, who are the, the, the really trending new and up and coming artists? art groups that I should be following in the NFT space. And other than discord groups, there ain't nobody. And, and if, and if, and if there are people, all they're talking about is like, Hey, how can I flip this for like a million bucks, man, and get my Gary V on and flip it up for 5,000. You know, it's like all, there's no like art discussion, right? There's no interesting sort of, you know, I mean, you, you, I've seen your books, right? You have books about, you know, collectible football cards and collectible coins and collectible, you know, like what's, you know, what has provenance and what doesn't have provenance. And, and that's another business idea that I can't find that exists. Well, right right, there's a couple things on that. And I'm not going to answer your question directly because you may be right on it. But if you go into OpenSea, you click on rankings so you can see it all time. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You've got all there. Yeah. But that's all based on trade price and favorites yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So it, it doesn't give you a lot of information. Like what it does, what it tells you is, what's you know it's like looking at a stock right you know it's it, like what's the highest level stocks that doesn't tell you what's going to trend tomorrow it t- it tells you what's trending today which is useless information if you're trying to buy collectibles on an investment basis or you know or anything there really. are you're right and i i don't know the names of there are a couple really good discord groups that have <laughs> yeah, yeah you just right. it's just very tough to find but know. what i would what i would do for anybody that you want to just kind of figure out some something i would go and and to the crypto Lar- go into the larva labs discord group larva labs is it, they have the og of nfts which are crypto punks they also have autoglyphs and mebits and it's worth worth checking them out they there's a really good vibrant discussion at all times and there's some smart people in there that are pretty open so if you had a question you want to dm somebody uh they're usually pretty good about answering those questions so anyways that's that's what i would say is a good resource yeah. out there but you're right maybe yeah. and maybe there maybe there is somebody's working on it or that's out there and we just don't know so yeah it may somebody be. knows it may be usually we're correct we're Tweet corrected often uh on this show yeah. so um by the way because somebody corrected me i should probably give a shout out to janice bloom uh which is at i bloom on twitter sent me a note and said uh hey joe both substack and review uh, email platforms it's super easy to export your subscribers email list and i think i said last episode it wasn't so easy so they're yeah. saying joe get your facts straight so janice thanks for uh, uh telling me i was wrong <laughs> i enjoy that at all times <laughs> to be wrong there we and go. i was so so there you go very very nice hey we got an opening breaking news story we- we got we got to talk we about. Do do you want me to, to we, take this one because I'm very excited. I want to I want to inter- I want to introduce okay. it and then I totally want you to talk about it. So there's this uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. There's this company um, this newsletter. They're called the Tilt. Have you heard of this? Right. Uh, uh, they have a new research report out. The 2021 Content Entrepreneur Benchmark 
report uh, called The Unconventionals. Uh, new research on who these unconventional content entrepreneurs are, what motivates them, how they're reshaping the digital economy. Sounds like a fantastic research report, Joe. What say you? <laughs> You're so kind. So I've been so excited that this thing, it, it's, it, we've been in the work for, works for six months. Uh, it's finally, uh, actually, this, this, it's out right now. So we're talking on Thursday, but Friday morning, we're releasing the research. You can get it at the tilt.com slash research. We're giving it away for free. You don't have to fill out any forms. You get it. We did a survey of 1,400 content entrepreneurs. And to my knowledge, maybe you know something I don't, Robert, but this is sort of the first benchmark about who these content create full-time content creators are that are trying to create a sustainable business uh, through what we've been talking about on the, on the show for a very, very long time. And there's a lot of very interesting findings. And I want to get your take with which what you thought was interesting. But what was, what was probably the most interesting to me is that um, there's a lot of people that were saying, don't call me an influencer. Like, I am really trying to build a business here. I've been putting my time and energy into it. Uh, there's some findings like mature content entrepreneurs have at least four different uh, revenue channels, which is awesome, right? They're, they're not just one or two truck ponies on this thing. Most of who we interviewed, the largest population of real content entrepreneurs, which are doing it full time, probably have somebody on staff. They're in the Gen X uh, age range. They're not millennials. They're not. They're not Gen Z. Um, freedom, independence, I don't want to work for somebody are key. Um, for new content entrepreneurs, COVID did make a big deal. Uh, basically, more than 50% said that the pandemic was a trigger for them becoming or wanted to become a content entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, so we go through all these. There's all these amazing stats. One that I've got one right in front of me because we've got 32 charts on this whole thing. But what's really interesting is if you look at we break this down into pre-revenue, early revenue, solopreneur, and entrepreneur. So entrepreneur is somebody that is has a full-time business, it's profitable, and they actually have at least one person on their team. The number one and the number two channels for these high-revenue entrepreneurs, number one, email newsletter, number two, blog. So every yeah. nobody, no everybody thinks social influencer, right? They're thinking TikTok, they're thinking Instagram, they're thinking Kim Kardashian. And I love this report because it says these are what these are the people that are really doing the work out there. They are the the middle class of the creator economy, if you will. So super excited about this. What did you have anything that really stood out to you looking at the report? I think I think two things. Um, one, because it's very top of mind for me right now in the book that I want to write, um, which was around the traditional education. Um, which basically the the respondents said that um, eighty five percent of them said that a college degree isn't a requirement as a content dropper, which you sort of into you know you sort of if your gut instinct would be like right that makes total sense right you don't need to have a college you know an MBA to figure sure. this stuff out, but I think what it speaks to me is the irrelevance right now of a university education um, of what university truly is right now and. Um, I think there's a bigger there's a bigger challenge there that we could definitely talk about, um, and that's what I want to write a book about. Um, the second one that really stood out to me was the time that um, you know average was nine months, uh, and the re the reason I love the nine months answer was because that's the answer you used to sort of glibly you know give out at every workshop speech you gave, et cetera, et cetera. You were like, start it's, something. it's yeah. about nine months, right? Yeah, and and it turns out. That's By the exactly way, nine, right. nine months, um, yeah, nine months to first dollar. So that's if you're right. a marketer and then out there, yeah, if you're a marketer out there, that's nine months to some significant, significant audience where you can actually exactly. show ROI. That's what we're talking about. That's right. And 26 months until you actually generate enough income to support one person, um, which I thought was also interesting because, you know, it speaks a lot to, you know, I mean, we're not going to talk a lot about it on this particular episode, but there is a lot of news around funding, around investors looking at this around, you know, and I know the the stats basically say most of it is self-funded, but I think what you've got there is sort of a, an interesting tension between the, you know, let's just call it what it is, the privileged class that can actually spend two years without income doing something and those who can't. Um, and I, it's just going to be very interesting to watch 
how success happens in different class mm-hmm. levels. Um, so, you know, those without funding, those with funding, because it does take time. It takes time. And, you know, it's like any other basically growing any other business. Um, you know, you've got you, you've got a, 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 a ramp up time that's going to take before you make you know, make your rent. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's a huge challenge and one that needs to be thought through very carefully. Somebody was talking to somebody about this taking nine months to first dollar. And I said, this is the reason why I actually got into business again to create this thing called the tilt, because we have to shorten that time. That's exactly what you said. If I'm, if I put some savings, most of, I think 75% of content entrepreneurs used personal savings and then, and then another 20% use credit cards and very little have other investment. Great. You're right. Oh, I have got some savings. I can wait two years till I can make this thing. A lot of people can't. What do you do in the meantime? You've yeah. got to generate revenue as soon as possible. So we've got to shorten that nine months to like two or three months. Well, that's where I think the interesting connection comes to the education thing, right? Which is right now you've got a bunch of content entrepreneurs who are launching their businesses and they believe, I think rightfully so, that college isn't going to help them shorten that window. And I have to believe that they are looking for anything and everything that can help them shorten that window. And so if your BHAG as an organization is to shorten the time window, the time horizon window of 26 months to 18 months to 15 months to 12 months, wow, what a valuable service that is to provide this new economy, right? And I think that's a... It's an incredibly bullish vote for the tilt and and everything you're doing from the education standpoint. Well, I, I'm going to need some help. So, I, do you know anybody that that know that that knows how to teach classes have, and things? I have, um, <laughs> I have no idea. I have no it, idea it's, who you're talking about. The my pet peeve, and this and I've talked about it on this show before, about I I don't necessarily like the passion economy or creator economy, mostly because it get it gets so hung up on the platforms. Here's what Patreon's doing and here's what Twitter's doing and Facebook is spending a billion dollars on creators and every all the talk is what these big platforms are doing and nobody's talking about the person, the business person trying to build this thing and the tools that they need outside of just, I'm an influencer on YouTube and YouTube's going to pay me advertising or I'm an influencer on Substack and Substack is going to underwrite my newsletter or podcast. Those are few and far between. What does everyone else do? So I think that's what we're focused on is look at everyone else that you're right. I hate, look, I went to college for six and a half years. So I, I'm a big proponent of education, but honestly, to do these things today, you don't need a formal education. And I, I, they all said 95% said, what was it? 95%, 85% said, you don't need to go to college. They don't feel that's you, right. Yeah. yeah. Do you okay? Or do you think a college degree degree is required to succeed as a content entrepreneur? Eighty five percent said no. I can operate my content business anywhere with reliable internet. Ninety five percent said yes. You can do this business from anywhere in the world with a smartphone and a Wi Fi. Yeah. Which is, by the way, wonderful uh, for all us people that thought you had to be in an office for all these years. So, anyways, I'm glad you're excited about good it, report. I'm, yeah, it's a great report. Um, um, this is sort of the thing where we've, yeah, we've, we've had the, the tilt. It's We've been running since early April. We've got the two newsletters. Everything's great. But this is sort of us to the world saying, hey, hello, we're here. We're here. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we're, we're trying Here's to do something here. Here's what we do. Here. So, That's right. But Well, I mean, not to put too weird of a meta layer on this, but you're a content creator, you know, and, and you're a content entrepreneur. And, oh, goodness gracious, here we, you know, I mean, you're living the lesson and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's both admirable and it's also a much needed, uh, service for those in the community. And so I, you know, I have, I have nothing but high hopes and, uh, confident predictions for, for the, you know, for the future. Thank you, sir. Uh, I appreciate it. The tilt.com slash research. You can get it for free, pass it around to your friends. And we probably talked enough about it because we have a boatload of news. So 
We, we do have a boatload of news. Um, well, speaking of success, um, and you know, and specifically to uh, a couple of weeks ago when we ranted a little bit about uh, whether or not the economy and marketing as budgets were going up or down, well, earning seasons is upon us, folks, and we'll link to a couple of different stories in the show notes, but the first one we'll just link to comes to us courtesy of USA Today. Uh, big tech, big earnings, Apple, Microsoft, Google, uh, Alphabet, all report just blow your doors off, uh, out of the water stuff. Um, Apple uh, is basically blowing the doors off the, 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 uh, their, their uh, results. To 21.7 billion or a dollar 30 per share. Uh, Google, 69% growth in the advertising business. Uh, Facebook, growing and fastest growing uh, revenue, uh, I guess, ever. Um, it's an amazing set of uh, statistics as we're starting to see all of these big tech companies and especially those that are really focused in on the advertising model uh, really just just crush it. Um, and it's it, so it, uh, my, 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 my immediate take is like, all right, we thought at Facebook was really going to suffer um, because of the sort of, you know, brand challenges they're having. And of course, uh, organic reach and but advertising best quarter to revenue growth rate in more than five years. They had uh, Google. We keep predicting the end of search advertising and banner advertising, but yet 69 percent growth. I think it was. Um, Apple, everybody says the iPhone is dead. No, of course it's not. They're, they're just crushing it. So I don't know. What do you, do you take anything away from these major companies just having banner quarters? You know, I, I, I read the releases that you sent and I just had to take a moment because Apple profits, this is just quarterly, 21 billion for Apple, 18 right. billion for Alphabet, Google, 16 billion for Microsoft. And then if you think about it from a content creation standpoint, you know, Microsoft absolutely with uh, their collaboration content, video games, they're all in on content creation. Uh, Alph uh, Alphabet is obviously Discovery with Google. You've got Apple, all the dist content distribution platform, uh, Apple TV Plus, the whole thing. Uh, these, these companies are uh, Facebook, of course, which, which is interesting, by the way, because... If you look at the numbers with Facebook, they're running out of old people. Uh, is, and that's Facebook's problem. Not Facebook the company, but Facebook the entity itself online. Instagram and WhatsApp are really driving what's going on with Facebook. So it's unbelievable. And, yeah. and I think that Oculus and what whatever you know Zuckerberg thinks is the metaverse, I think Ready Player One is probably going to happen in the next 15 years. And Facebook is going to have a piece of that because of their drive into Oculus and virtual. The, Eh, we'll see. Microsoft is going to give them no, a run no, no. for their money. I, but you that. know what? Yeah. All yeah, four yeah. of these companies will, and they're becoming more powerful than right. governments. The only thing that these four companies can't do is declare war. <laughs> yeah. they're pr they well, pretty much are. As, they're close they're to they're that too. Yeah, they're most, close to yeah, that. They're more powerful than most countries. And by the way, this is next quarter. They're going to have more money, and the next quarter they're going to have more. This is not stopping anytime soon, especially with interest rates no. the way they are. The money printer go burr, You know, is just. This is not going to stop. I don't have yeah. a, you know, political or social commentary on the fact. I just don't know what to do when you've got four or five. I say if you if you look at companies like Tencent, Alibaba, JD, you've got ten companies that are basically ruling the world right now. It's just and they're growing and they're swallowing up everything else. What happens in ten years when their their trillion dollar trillion dollars a quarter? in profit and, and what are they going to do with all that money <laughs> what do you do with all that money yeah. when cash doesn't make you anything seriously I, that's yeah. my question yeah no it's it, well you start acquiring yes. companies right you start you know you start consolidating and and that's you know you know you've you've made this point before but you know by the way this is the, these are only the tectonic shifts that are happening in the marketplace you know you can sort of extrapolate that this kind of growth um, for tech um, is happening, you know, across the board. You know, B2, by the way, this is happening on the B two B side too. Oracle, uh, oh, yeah, Salesforce, shoot. others. Absolutely. You know, you know, yeah. They those are they're having great, great, great years too. So, you know, 
is you just start to get consolidation in the marketplace because it starts to you know get smaller and smaller. And you know, there's a tension growing with the whole antitrust uh, ideas here. But um, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But it's it, for, as a marketer, I look at this and it it makes me feel uh, worried and opportunistic at the same time. Right? It's sort of like it it it's a little bit of a a ra- you know a, a sort of a raging river that you've got your you know your raft ready to go on and you're ready to you know you're ready to do it you're ready to shoot the rapids and and boy it's it it puts butterflies in your stomach when we start to think about all of the all of the changes that this kind of this kind of growth fuels as well as all of the sort of dangers of getting sucked under the the you know not to belabor this metaphor too much but you know basically you know there's it it's it's fraught with a lot of danger as well as a lot of excitement and and it's just going to be very interesting to see what happens in the next you know it, especially as we start really coming out of the you know 2022 and coming out of the pandemic and and all of that is going to be it'll be fascinating yeah the last thing i'll say on it we i say it almost every episode but i have to say it as well with all this money floating around uh it's a great time to be a content entrepreneur if you want an exit yeah. strategy and you if you say hey in 5 years could i could i sell my content brand my my audience so whatever i'm monetizing it for 10 20 25 million dollars us it's there in spades if you, if you yep. want if you want to do that because people the, people have the money and they're willing to spend premium uh, right now yeah. because they don't. What do they get? It. They can't put it in. The banks won't even take it. We talked about that at length in the last issue. In Europe right now, if you put money in the bank, you're making negative interest rates. You're actually losing money on your cash. That's so right. So you have to put it to work right now. And one way they're going to put it to work, they're going to buy a lot of advertising, which you just made that point. Advertising business is fantastic. Well, they're also going to buy a lot of own properties. <sighs> yeah, they are. Here he comes. Here it comes. <laughs> Bow chicka, in, wow, a world. Wow. <laughs> in a world. In a world. All right, moving on to our next story really quickly here. Uh, speaking of the fang, as it were, the Facebook, the Amazons, the Googles, uh, the Apples, whoever you put into those acronyms, the N in that, of course, is Netflix. Um, and Netflix uh, has making the news this week uh, as they are set to open their first physical store as they start expanding into the retail business. The article opens up by saying Netflix is expanding its retail operations further as it announces plans to open its first ever permanent physical store next year. The streaming giant, which opened its debut online store last month, which we talked about on this show and how lame it was, uh, plans to open a high tech physical store in Tokyo, Japan in 2022 aiming to merge the virtual world of the internet with the real world. Netflix is understood to be introducing a host of experiential features to its new store while selling a range of merchandise from its most popular shows in line with its online offering, according to the Japan Times. Uh, so what say you? I definitely have a take on this, uh, but I'm curious to get yours, Mr. Polizzi. What do you think, what do you think what about Netflix it? here? What was it? Two episodes, three episodes, we did the analysis yeah. of Netflix online retail offering. We thought it was the yeah, silliest was... thing that's ever been created. Well, wop, this wop, is wop. what we asked yeah. for. We asked for yeah. do this do the uh, Queen's Gambit, do the uh do the Stranger Things, sell everything you can, sell your plush toys, sell people want that. That's your fan experience is take that to another level. We all know first rule of content entrepreneurship, content creation, content marketing is diversify your revenue streams or your ROI. So figure figure that out. Netflix is almost all subscription based. So what are they going to do to take it to the next level? They've got to monetize in multiple ways. They have some amazing brands. So they need to start getting to work. I'm all in favor of this. I would absolutely go and check this out. I could see the the Netflix stores being what Microsoft tried to do with Microsoft stores, and and I don't think did very well, but I think that uh, Apple is a good formula for them. Not maybe as highbrow a brand, but I think you'll you'll see Netflix at any kind of shopping area, uh, and I think that it's a great opportunity. I don't know. Do you agree with that? I do. I, I think you know. It, to me, it's a little more akin to what Disney has done with yes, the Disney stores, yes. um, and. Uh, 
what I think I would say is what's most pronounced to me is how most people will look at this story and shrug their shoulders and go, well, of course they do. Uh, of, of course they're going to do this, right? I mean, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you, if you were Netflix, open up a physical store to sell merchandise of your main media yeah. properties? But if this exact situation were reversed, imagine the news story if, for example, Starbucks announced that it was going to launch a streaming service with, you know, 22 new online shows and movies um, centered on, uh, you know, the, the, the culture of coffee and the culture of, you know, whatever, right? And it was going to basically launch a competing service to Netflix and Apple TV and, and all of that and was going to invest accordingly. And people would be going, the, the, already there would be riots most in the streets. Head, well, yeah, I mean, or 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 more <laughs> more realistically, people would be like, "That's ridiculous! I, I can't! I mean, what 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 are you talking about?" You know, they they would scoff at the idea because assuming some product oriented brand can have expertise around delivering online media seems to be like this weird skeevy thing, whereas believing that media companies have expertise in the ability to roll out a supply chain and physical product and all of that seems like, oh, well, of course they can. That's yeah. easy. That, everybody sure. does that, right? So it's just, it's just a very, uh, yeah, it's just a very strange, strange thing I, to I, me. I never have understood that. And by the way, we should be seeing more of that happen. The Starbucks launching the, the media enterprise uh, we you just don't you just don't hear. I mean, first of all, it's happened. It's already happening. Most large brands have some kind of a media unit. It's just not talked about very often, and the media doesn't want to talk about it. It's not sexy to them. But it it's here and it's going to grow, and you're going to see the other side of this now, tomorrow, next yeah, week. Yeah, that's right. And why they why and yeah. why a Starbucks? I don't know about a coffee streaming network, but why they're well, not I just into Starbucks is what came to mind, right? With yeah. especially with, did I talk about this last time? They have, I saw the stat. There's 1.4 billion dollars in Starbucks reward, uh, dollars that ha, that's not being used. It's just sitting there. Oh yeah, they're a finance company. God. Yeah, they're a fintech company. I mean that's that's what it that's what that's Starbucks you, is. They don't even need yeah. to sell coffee anymore. All they have to do is take that 1.4 billion dollars and make a five percent return on it every year. They're fine. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, that it's like it, it just blows your mind, right? I mean, yeah, it's 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 a it's a very it, interesting time. It, well, if you've been, you probably haven't been following this, but do you know who Michael Saylor is? Okay, I know so the Michael name. Saylor's the CEO of MicroStrategy, and Michael Michael Saylor yeah. is the guy that came out last year about this time actually, and he said we're going to put our corporate treasury, we're going to put a couple hundred million dollars into Bitcoin. And then he did it again and did it again. And then so now MicroStrategy owns, I don't know, a billion plus dollars worth of Bitcoin. It's on its corporate treasury. And everyone was saying, well, MicroStrategy is uh, a software company. And and he's responsive to that and say, what, we, we can't make money other ways? I can make money. <laughs> I can I can do anything I want. I get, I could, it, I don't just have to keep selling software. I, I can make money off of Bitcoin. I can, you know, why do I have it just be an ice, a melting ice cube sitting in cash? He talks about that all the time. I, I think that now is a really good time to look at our business model and say, hey, we don't have to just sell coffee. We don't have to just sell software. When you have an That's audience, right. how many times have we talked about this in meetings? When you have a loyal audience, you can pretty much sell anything you want if the audience is willing to buy it because they trust you. Right. I don't well, hate to be that frank about I mean, it, but it's true. Well, I I, I, I was going to kid you about this, um, but it's just such a wonderfully ingenious move. Um, you're the living example of this, of course. Um, uh, you know, in both companies that you've launched uh, over the last 10 years. Um, but I loved you put out this Facebook, I think it was either Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, maybe all of them. Um, but where I saw it, where you, where you basically set out to the audience, Hey, if there was like a coffee cup with like a really awesome saying on it, what would it say? 
<laughs> and you know, so you're crowdsourcing basically product I, development. Absolutely. You know, basically, you're saying you're, you're basically saying, tell us what you'd buy from us if we, you know. It, I just it's well, it's you wonderful want to know and they, beautiful. You want to know a, how that came about? So we're we're uh, yeah. Laura and the rest of the team we're all talking back and forth on email because we're launching a merchandise store. It's no secret we're launching right. merch. My plan is we're going to launch as many different revenue lines as we can. So that's one of our revenue lines. And we're all thinking about, well, what should go on a mug? And we're spending really quality time trying to figure this out. And I'm like, this is silly. We have a whole community out there. So I just threw it out there to Twitter. And we got like, I don't know, like 100 different comments on it. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Some really good ones, too. So we were thinking about we'd actually put the Twitter address on the ones we accept to throw out a little bit of love. But there anyways, yes. Uh, Why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Multiple lines of revenue, Cause, folks. Because who doesn't it. want another coffee mug? That's really who doesn't need another coffee Man. mug, especially a logoed one I with need, your Twitter yeah, one with a on. big That's... orange arrow. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I need. Oh, I can't wait till I get that one. Exactly. Oh, shoot. Exactly. All right. Moving on to our last story before we get to rants and raves, of course, is coming to us courtesy of Axios. Uh, and it's about our wonderful favorite sort of meta topic here, which, of course, is podcasting. Uh, Spotify CEO Daniel Eck does a podcast on the future of podcasts. And we're so talking meta. about it on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's just more meta than I can take right now. The article opens up by saying Spotify on Wednesday reported significant ad revenue growth. See how folks this is all coming together uh, from its podcast business as part of its quarterly earnings disclosure. Company founder and CEO Daniel Eck uh, appeared on the Axios Recap podcast to discuss how the podcast business model is changing and why he's spending big on exclusive shows and his personal favorites in both podcasting and music. Some really interesting tidbits here from what he said on this wonderful podcast and in the article. We can touch on a couple of them here, but... Um, Something that's, that that really uh, stood out to me was that how much uh, really audiences are flocking more to podcasts than music, um, which is just a fascinating statistic um, or data point, I guess, um, that I'd make. Any What, what stood the, out to the, you, The one Joe? thing was it sounds to me that I, however it's going to work, Spotify is not going to share ad revenue with podcast creators. It's going to be through subscriptions and what – the CEO of Spotify says other podcast monetization options. I'm very interested in what the other podcast monetization options are, but it's, he's making it very clear that they're not going to share ad revenue. So, um, well, he's taking it. That's the Netflix yeah. model, right? I mean, they're not, they're not going to license. They're going to either acquire you outright or launch original shows. Yeah. Which I think is, I don't, I don't, they can do whatever they want. Again, I, I, these yeah. big platforms, you know, if we, if you were a creator, like, it's it's interesting. I'm torn. I used to listen. I know you weren't a listen, good, big listener of Joe Rogan. I would listen to a Joe Rogan podcast maybe once a month when Joe had a guest on that I really wanted to listen to. Since Joe went from open access on every uh, platform to just Spotify, I haven't listened one time. So the Joe Rogan is not nearly as popular as he was because he went to Spotify. Now he's fine. Cause he's making hundreds of millions of dollars from Spotify and Spotify likes even a, a smaller audience. But if they control that audience and can monetize that audience, that's great for Spotify, but it's a tough decision for some of these creators to say, cause you're, you're, you're taking a hit with your other revenue opportunities. You are Joe Rogan will yeah. never be as popular as he was before he did the Spotify deal. Yeah, I totally Howard agree. Stern is I, another I, good I, example. Yeah. Howard Stern. I love Howard Stern. I love what he's done for media. But Howard Stern has never been as popular as when he when he, when he was before the deal with Sirius XM. He is not as popular as he used to be. Yeah, that's true. It's absolutely true. And, but he may be richer. He's a lot richer. You know what I mean? And and which is you know what. Maybe that's the thing. Who cares about popularity, right? I guess it doesn't matter. That's right. If you if you yeah. know how to monetize it, Howard Stern's not doing a bunch of movies and books and all kinds of things like he like he once did before. So he's probably just happy doing his show, collecting, no problem. But again, it, there is a exactly. decision to make because Joe Rogan had to put it on paper and say, "I've got to sacrifice some revenue opportunities for this exclusivity on Spotify." Well, he. I think he may have. The, the calculus may have been slightly different, right? It may be not that I'm sacrificing revenue opportunities as much as it is a simplification of his business 
and sacrificing popularity. In other words, if you look at sort of the, you know, if you look at three points, right, you've got popularity, revenue, and effort, right, to, in order to, to maintain those things. And you say, okay, what is my effort going to be in order to maintain an open, on an open platforms to maintain the same level of revenue and the same level of popularity, which may or may not be tied together, um, and the level of effort there, right? So he's got a, he's got marketing expenses, he's got you know his time, he's got you know time away, you know traveling, all, all those kinds of things. And when you look at the calculus of saying doing a deal with Spotify, it's like all right, well I'm giving up one of those things, right, in order to benefit the other two. I'm I'm fact sacrificing popularity and notoriety in lieu of a great revenue model that may be smaller in sort of opportunity, but is guaranteed. You know, it's like, it's the classic sports analogy, right? How much you, it doesn't matter what your contract is. It's all about the guaranteed yep. money, right? And and so what he's looking at is the guaranteed money and saying, there's the guaranteed money and the level of effort. I get to cut all my costs in marketing. I get to cut all my costs in, uh, you know, in all the travel and everything else I'm doing for my personal life. Sign me up, right? Sign me up for that. I I, I, I totally understand that, that calculus. Well, they can do it. <laughs> you get. Yeah. I mean, it's sad for some of their audiences that have to that 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 get you know that don't get to listen to it anymore, or or that are not willing to pay for it anymore. You know, but at the end of the day, it's 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 really you know that's it's sort of up to them to make that you know. What's to make good that about this is continuing on with what we've talked about for the last how many weeks is there's more opportunities for content creators to drive revenue than ever before. That's right. And they're all yeah. fighting with each other. Spot now Spotify in particular is fighting with Apple. So they've you've got that going on. And you've got Amazon fighting with Facebook. And you, they're all and as long as they're all fighting with each other for all these creators, it's it's you're gonna win out. There's more opportunities than ever before. So if I'm if I That's back right. to your It opens yes. a slot. It absolutely opens when Joe Rogan leaving opens a slot. But back to your question about college, like it's interesting if if so, I mean, I've got two going to college right now, and if they said to me, which they haven't yet, Dad, I, I want to just create this thing online, the YouTube, Twitch, blog, e-newsletter, whatever they want to do, I, I probably would say, you go get them. Now, the only reason, the reason why I want them to go to college is just for that experience. I want them to get, of course, get into that's, crazy situations. Well, that's why you go to college go these days, right. life, go make mistakes and break things. Great. Exactly. That's what that right. is for. Go learn how to think, exactly. not what to think. Exactly. Yeah. But if you're just yeah. saying from a career standpoint, it's a no brainer for me. But what do yeah. I know? Yeah. All right. Moving on, folks, to our last part of the show, which is, of course, our rants and rave section where Joe and I go off on a little bit of a rant or a little bit of a rave over something that makes us feel like the new Guardians logo or something that makes us feel like we're standing on a bridge ready to. I don't know, jump off of it or something. I don't know. <laughs> what? So that really got, I, I don't know. got have, dark quickly. Yeah, it got there. dark fast. Yeah, it, it escalated quickly. Um, I have an extraordinarily short um, uh, uh, rave, I guess it is. So I just, I, let me just do that real quick. Um, and then I know you've got a rave as well. Um, so my rave is just going to be a link to a marketing dive. By the way, marketing dive, I don't know if they listen to the show or not, but just a, it's a well done site. I really am enjoying it um, as a way to get news about um, you know all the stuff that we all care about as marketers. They had a um, uh, an article that came out. Uh, let's see, about uh, two weeks ago now, and I missed it when it came out. It's called "Marketing in a Recovery: H1 2021 by the Numbers," and they basically just go through a number of statistics from a number of sorts. It's a roundup, basically research. Um, I just thought it, I found it incredibly helpful. I just, you know, I just bookmarked it. It's a great little resource. Um, just has a ton of, um, of just quick sound bites of half one of 20, you know, very recent research on everything from mobile to shifting budgets to loyalty to ad creative to just statistics on various things that have happened in the first part of this year. And I found it very helpful. So, Hat tip to Marketing Dive and hat tip for this article. I just thought it was really great. Just wanted to shout awesome. it out. That's that's a very yeah. strange rave for you. you. There's no rant. There's no, 
no no rant no rant this peace year in the world no, 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 no. And, and that's just it. peace in the world feeling a little like uh jack dorsey this <laughs> did, did, I shaved my head well, through my this beard is a really strange episode because i have two very quick yeah. raves so wait we're, okay. we're a rave fest here going on this is fantastic yeah one yeah. is to a youtuber called miles beckler and I'm going to put this in the show notes. He recorded a video called The End of an Era. Miles Beckler has been uh, basically on YouTube for a long time. He's been posting uh, almost every other day for a very, very, very long time. He now has 184,000 subscribers. He's generated more than a million dollars in revenue. He, he talks about it all the time. This podcast was really interesting to me because he talks about how he is not going to play to the YouTube algorithm anymore. And... The biggest thing that I got from this, Robert, is it, it, it's so simple, but it's true and it's worth talking about. He said, there's so much work you put up front when you become a content entrepreneur and you do video, 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 and you're making no money. And then you get to this point where you have all the, you have this audience and this leverage, and then you can scale back and you don't have to do as much content for to make the same amount of impact and you can generate a large amount of revenue. So basically, oh, he basically talks about how much, so he said, if you're willing to work for two to three years and work your butt off, you're not gonna make a lot of money. But if you get, once you get to that point, you basically could do whatever you want. You don't have to work that much. You could you could set it on cruise control. And so basically, that's what he said he's saying. He's, he's looking after his lifestyle. He's only gonna, I think he said, he's gonna do one video a week now. He's not gonna video every other day. Uh, and he is he's got making forty or fifty thousand dollars a month now and he's done. He's like, that's it. That's and I just I loved the simplicity of it because that's really how it works. You don't make anything for the first two to three years, but then once you build a loyal audience, it opens up all these possibilities for revenue. Subscription subscription is a lovely, lovely, lovely really? thing. It, it just really is. is. It, the recurring revenue is is the most loveliest of business models. It truly, truly is. The second rave I have, and this, my friend Becky turned me on to uh, this episode of Armchair Expert with Dak Shepard. Do you listen to Armchair Expert? I have listened to a few episodes and and quite enjoyed. He's interesting. What I to, he's but really I'm not, smart. I'm not he's a really, subscriber. He's really smart. Yeah, by he's the way. very so, smart. Yeah, he's so Dak Shepard yeah. is actor performer. Uh, he. Uh, I think he's he ever does. I don't know if Kristen Bell is still on the show, but it was always Dax Shepard and Kristen Bell. Anyways, doesn't matter. This latest episode was with Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher, which, who, by the way, are married and they were on that 70s show together for you histori television historians. This episode, if you want to understand crypto and NFTs and nobody's been able to explain it to you, like Robert and Joe can't explain it to you, listen to this episode. They just talk about it in such – Dax is so good about asking questions and putting things into metaphors that are understandable. And they talk – basically, Mila Kunis is launching an NFT of her new project called Stoner Cats, which is so funny. But uh, she's launching it as an NFT so people can buy in before they pr produce it, all that kind of stuff, kind of like a Gary V Friends kind of thing. But uh, they talk about why – you know, what is Bitcoin? What is Ethereum? Uh, why cryptocurrency, the whole thing from a layman's point of view. And I'll put the, you know, just search on armchair expert. By the way, Dax just got like a $60 million deal or something on Spotify too. So this is only on Spotify if you want to listen to this podcast. But a rave for that just because I was listening to it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so simple. Anybody could understand it. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. That's I love it. it. I absolutely love it. All right, my friend. Well, what do you got this week? You're launching the new research. That's yep. fantastic. Um, what else is on tap for the tilt? Uh, well, the the big thing this coming week is on Monday. It is our um, Orange Effect Foundation 15th annual Golf for Autism. Oh, yeah, I so love So we it. have a couple hundred people it. coming out to Illyria Country Club in uh, in Illyria, Ohio. They'll be golfing. All the proceeds go to speech therapy for kids that need it and their families can't afford it. Um, they've been able, it's, it's unbelievable. We've been doing this since 2007 and we're almost at giving away, uh, almost a million dollars to over 200 kids in 34 States. And this is one of our big fundraisers that you've supported every year. So thank you very much. But, uh, but yeah, so that's what we'll be doing on Monday. So I'll be golfing 36 holes 
but for a great car calls on, <laughs> on Monday. So that's a, that's what we're doing there. And if you'd like to give, of course, the orange effect.org, uh, we, we are a fundraising organization and then we distribute those funds to kids who need it. So if speech therapy or autism are, uh, in, you know, big deals in your life or to your friends and family, then, uh, and you'd like to support that cause, please do. And what do you have going on this weekend? Uh, well, this weekend, I'm taking my first airplane flight. Whoa. I'm going up to see my, yeah, I'm going to go see my brother-in-law, um, uh, which, no spoiler alert here, it's, it's a surprise. He doesn't listen to the podcast, so I'm not worried about him hearing this, but it is Ooh. a surprise uh, for his uh, for his birthday, um, and we're all getting together um, as a big family uh, up in uh, Northern California and surprising him with uh, our appearance there, um, fully outside and all the rest of it these days. But um, it should be fun. So I'll be able to report back next time we talk about what airline flight is like. And then I'm getting ready for the next, my first business trip, which of course I'll see you on um, in, uh, in a couple of weeks in Chicago doing our uh, wonderful, uh, the Agency Management Institute's uh, event, BABA event. Um, and I'm getting that presentation ready. So I'm kind of full into uh, writing, creating, and hopefully having a little bit of fun time with my I family. I can't believe it. We're actually going to be. I think you're, you're, on, you're doing a keynote, but maybe two hours before I am or something like that. It's our first time on stage uh, it's, in a long I time. I think it's, yeah, it's the more, I'm the morning, you're the afternoon. So That's good. Yeah. You'll get them when they're all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and I'll get them when they're ready for drinks. But... That's right. There you go. Uh, that, you know, that, which can also work because you know they can just start drinking early. Which, which by the, uh, which the is key. a really good tactic. Which I would, if I can do that, yeah. I will ask them to to start. Maybe I can for somebody that asks a question, they can have a drink, free drink, or something like that. Open up a bottle That's of wine. It. There Absolutely. we go. Looking forward to it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're signing off. If you want to get all the goodness of this podcast show notes or dive into any of the other 281 episodes, just head on over to our wonderful website at thisoldmarketing.site. Of course, we want to thank the good folks at Radix for powering our thisoldmarketing.site. And just remember, until we meet again, remember, folks, it's your story to tell. Tell it well. We'll see you next week on This Old Marketing.